I'm a 3D artist and in this video we're going to turn this simple cube into this 3D character using Blender. Once we've done that, we're going to bring the character to life using a 3D printer. Before we dive into the sculpting, to help with this project, I was sent a graphics tablet and it's the PD1610 by Gaiman. So we're going to unbox that first, get it set up and then after we finish sculpting I'll let you know what I think of it. So this is the box it comes in, which to be honest I'm not usually too bothered with because let's be honest it's just a box, but I did think that this looked pretty nice. But when I opened the box, I'll be honest, I was a little bit disappointed, at least initially. Now don't get me wrong, the tablet does look and feel pretty slick, and at 16 inch the screen is a good size and it feels really nice to hold. But when I checked the back, I noticed straight away that there's no option for visa mounting, which essentially means there's no holes in the back to screw this into something else. Now it did come with a stand and to be fair it does look pretty nice, I do like the black and white design. But when I'm at my desk, I like to mount my tablet on an arm so that I can get my keyboard underneath it. So it was a little bit disappointing that I couldn't do this. But it's not a deal breaker since you can buy universal Visa adapters for tablets. And that is actually what I ended up doing, but more on that later. Now to be fair, they're not very expensive, it's just an extra cost that I'd rather not spend. The pen feels pretty decent as you'd expect, uh, it feels nice to hold and I like the pattern on the buttons, it gives it a nice bit of grip. And it comes with a pen holder and inside is where you'll find your spare nibs. Now of course there's a few cables in the box, there's a USB-C which plugs into the tablet to dual USB, one to power the tablet and the other for input to the computer, along with the HDMI cable for video transfer as well. Now I was a bit concerned when I saw this because there really isn't that much length to these cables. I'd either need to extend one of them or have the computer and power socket really close together. But that's before I noticed the USB-C to USB-C cable. The great thing about these is that they're able to transfer video, data and power in one cable, which means I don't even need the other cables. It does mean that I'd need to use my laptop rather than my desktop since my graphics card doesn't have a USB-C connection. But given that there's no option to mount the tablet on an arm, it kind of makes sense to use this with a mobile setup anyway. It's relatively compact, it just about fits in my laptop bag at a push. It's light and it can be used with a single cable. So. If I'm travelling, I can pack my laptop, tablet and screen and have the three screen set up wherever I go. Now left in the box we have a quick start guide along with a microfiber cloth and one of those gloves that make you look like a, a proper digital artist. Now although I did just say that this tablet would probably work best in my mobile setup, I am going to experiment using it at my desk and the reason for that is that I want to test this out in a familiar environment so that external factors don't affect my opinion if that makes sense. I wouldn't want something like using my laptop keyboard instead of my regular keyboard affecting my opinion on the tablet because that's not the tablet's fault. So with that being said, let's now move on to sculpting the character and see how it performs. Alright so moving on to the sculpting, if you've seen any of my previous videos you'll know that this isn't usually how I record them. Rather than have a camera pointed at my screen I would normally capture the screen directly using OBS and we will revert to that in a moment. However this graphics tablet is a bit different to my previous display tablets in that the resolution is 16x10 rather than 16x9. This means that the tablet feels nice to use because it gives you more vertical space and that is a good thing for most people. But it also means that recording my screen results in these black bars which doesn't look very good. It also meant that I couldn't use my capture card since the resolution of this tablet isn't supported. That being said, this is quite a niche problem and I think for most users the 16x10 resolution would actually be a positive thing. Now fortunately I was able to force a 16x9 resolution for the purpose of recording in a moment, but first I had another problem. As I mentioned earlier, normally when I work I have my display tablet mounted on an arm, 
and there's a couple of reasons for this. First, it means that I can get my keyboard underneath the tablet, which for me is the most comfortable place to keep it. It also means that I have full control over the eye level and orientation of the tablet, which I tend to adjust into different positions while I'm working. But since there was no option for visa mating with this tablet, it meant that I had to use the provided stand, which proved uncomfortable for various reasons. Firstly, the eye level was an issue. Since I had to look down while I was using it, I very quickly started to get neck pain. I also tend to work with my screen at around 75 degrees, so almost vertical, but the highest angle I was able to get it to was only about 45 degrees. So what I ended up doing was raising the tablet using boxes and books, and then using the laptop stand to get the tablet into a more vertical position. This setup also allowed me to bring the keyboard slightly underneath the screen instead of the unnatural position off to the side. And this seemed to work fine for a while. And then I sculpted for a couple of hours like this and the pain started to creep back in and I had to give in and order a, a universal visa mount, which essentially creates a cradle for the tablet to sit in, which you can mount to your arm. Now, the one that I was sent wasn't exactly as advertised because it was miles too big, but it worked anyway, so I just ended up keeping it. It was a lot more comfortable than what I was doing before. And it was also at this point that I noticed that the footage I was recording on my camera wasn't the best quality. And so I did end up changing the resolution on the tablet to 16 by nine so that I can record the screen. So apologies if the video does seem to jump a little bit here. It's just that the footage that I had just wasn't that great. Okay, so let's focus on the sculpting for a bit now. So once I had a head in place, it was time to work on the body. And for this, I imported a rigged mannequin. This is a bit of a new approach to me since previously, I would just sculpt the whole character to pretty much finished anatomy in an air pose and then rig it for posing. However, by posing a simple mannequin like this, it's a lot easier to experiment with different poses and ideas and move things around before sculpting more detailed anatomy. Kind of like making thumbnail sketches before committing to a final drawing. Plus another benefit of sculpting a pose model is that it also avoids having to re-sculpt areas that aren't correct after posing. You know, since fat and muscle forms change, when we change positions. Once I've found a pose that I'm happy with though, I do like to keep a copy of the mannequin so that I can get back to a symmetrical position later and I've just got a model then to model clothing around in a symmetrical position so I only have to model half of it. And then I can use the mannequin to pose the clothing into the position of my pose character. And I'm satisfied with how the body's looking for now, so I move on to creating the hair. And for this, I still use the hair curve technique, but I am aiming for a simpler style now that I model for 3D print, and by which I'm mainly referring to having less flyaway strands because they tend to be very thin and snap quite easily when printed. Also, since I've started printing characters, this process now takes me much longer than it did before because I need to make sure that it's working from every perceivable angle and not to be lazy and make it just look good in the 2D render. It's quite tedious. So as I just mentioned, to model the clothing, I get the old mannequin back and bring it into a symmetrical position. This means that I only have to model the shirt on one side and let the mirror modifier do the other for me. Then once I've got the basic shape, I can attach the shirt to the rig and then move it into the pause position and detail it out from there. Now you might also notice that I also modeled the arms of the shirt separately at first because it makes it a lot easier to fix any pausing issues. When I'm happy with the positioning, I can then attach the arms to the main part of the shirt and continue sculpting from there. Now I know I want this to be a bust and so I delete the hands and legs and add a simple shape for the base and just generally work on improving all areas of the model. Now I'm feeling like I want to start painting the skin soon so I begin setting up the scene and working on the lighting. Now it's not entirely necessary to do this but I find that having as close to an approximation as what the final render will look like as possible when you're painting the skin is a good thing. It makes the job a bit easier, at least for me anyway. And you might be wondering, is it even necessary to paint skin when I'm modeling this for 3D print? And the answer is no, not at all. 
but I do also plan to post a rendered version of the sculpt, so that's why I'm doing this. Now the head isn't actually meshed to the body, it's still rigged at this point, which means that I can bring it back to a symmetrical position for painting. I start by covering the head with a skin tone and then adding a warmer tone to the nose, cheeks, ears, chin and lips. I am going on a little bit heavy here, but I do tone this back by going over it with the skin tone later. And I do also occasionally check to see how it looks in cycles too, since this is the renderer that it will finally be rendered with. Now normally I would also go in and paint a bit of variation to the hair and add textures to the clothing, but I am feeling like the main focus is the print as opposed to the render, and so doing these things would add quite a lot of time, so I'll leave the rest as block colours and move on. I kind of feel like this gives it a bit more of a 3D printed aesthetic anyway. To start preparing the model for print, I send everything over to ZBrush. Now, I know there's gonna be a few disappointed die-hard Blender fans that I'm bringing stuff into ZBrush, but I think the work involved here is quite system intensive and would cause Blender to fall over. At least I think it would, I could be wrong. I haven't actually tried it because I know how Blender can be, but maybe I should give it a try. Who knows, maybe I'll do that in the next video. But a nice perk of sending it over to ZBrush is that the different material highlighted some mistakes that I hadn't spotted in Blender, which was pretty useful. Now, when it comes to preparing a model for 3D print, I have no shame in admitting that I am a complete noob going into this as you're about to see. That said, I have run through a couple of courses and learned a lot from my mistakes during this project, so I am feeling a lot more adept now, but I did fail quite epically on this project. So what happened is, I was subtracting the hair from the head using booleans with the idea that the hair could then be keyed into the head later. Then somebody in the chat, in the live stream on Twitch, link below, Somebody in the chat suggested subtracting the head from the hair. And yes, I am pushing the blame a little bit away from me. And after trying that, to my noob eyes, this looked a lot cleaner. You know, we've got a full head intact and the hair can just slide on top of it later. And maybe you can see where this is going, but we'll see if this works shortly. But before we get into that, I've been using this Gaumann tablet for a little while now. Uh, I've actually used it for another project too, so I feel like I've got enough hours of use to feel informed enough to have a decent opinion. Obviously, I didn't have the greatest start as it took me a while to get comfortable with it and I think that's because this is possibly intended to be more of a portable option rather than one that sits at your desk all the time. I mean, it's plenty big enough to work on while just about small enough to get into your laptop bag and it can be connected to your laptop with a single cable. So for that reason, I'm guessing it's probably not intended to be attached to an arm, but for me personally, that's a must have. But once I got past that, once I'd sorted it out with the universal visa mount, I've got to say that sculpting with it feels really nice. I remember just a few years back, the general opinion was that your tablet needed to have Wacom written on it. And if you pay less money for a tablet, then you're inevitably compromising in some way. And to some extent, this was true. There would be problems installing drivers or problems with pen lag or pressure issues or the fact that you have to charge your pen before it would work. There were problems with parallax and screen glare and perhaps even more issues that I can't even remember now because they don't exist anymore. The driver's installed without a problem. The pen works out of the box and it doesn't need to be charged. I've had no issues with pressure sensitivity and the screen is fully laminated so it's practically a pen to paper experience. It just works and I don't think you can really ask for much more than that. So my final opinion on this tablet is if you're on the fence, go for it. It's a good price, it's good quality, just do bear in mind that you might want to consider investing in a universal visa mount. They're not that expensive to be fair, if you're anything like me and like to you know, get the keyboard underneath the tablet. But if you're happy to work with it just like this, go for it. It's, it's decent, I like it. So now, 
back to the print. Now I've used mesh mixer to hollow out the model and then used ZBrush to add drain holes. Then it was on to Lychee to add supports and check for suction cups. Now my current approach to adding supports is to first use auto supports to save time and then to go through and check it and just add or remove supports as needed. Now normally I'll remove supports if it's in a delicate area that might break the model when I come to remove it. And then of course it was off to printer for the first print. Now I couldn't fit everything onto the plate for the first print and I was okay with this because I wanted a model that was a bit bigger in size anyway. But looking back it would have been better to just shrink everything down into, you know, so that I could print it all at once and just check that everything fits together properly, you know, before printing it big. Because there is no way I am ever gonna get this hair on this head without breaking it. It just won't go in. Because the hair grows around the back of the head and sort of sweeps around to the front, it, there's, the hole's just not big enough to get the head in. And, you know, it's a fail. It's a massive fail, unfortunately. And I realized pretty much immediately that this is probably, you know, a very beginner mistake to make. But to be fair, I am a beginner. And yeah, that's a mistake I will not be making again. Now I have been doing a little bit of research on YouTube and I've been watching people put together garage kit models and I've seen how the head and the hair is often put together by splitting the front and the back into different sections uh, and also incorporating pretty much all of the head into the hair piece. Which, you know, makes sense. You don't need a clean full head like that because once you put the hair on, you can't see it anyway. So, you know, I do, I kind of get that. I kind of get how that's working. And with this knowledge, I did have a go at fixing up this model so that it would work properly. But I quickly realized that really, you wanna be modeling this from the start, otherwise it's quite a lot of work. So I decided to take this knowledge into my next character instead. But I did manage to print this out. So I, I'm not gonna take the hair off now, but I essentially filled in a lot of the back of the hair with head and then sort of just about slid it in. I don't want to take this off because I probably won't get it back on without snapping anything. But before I show you close up the final result, I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you want to see future content don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell and I will see you in the next video.